Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? Open your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Nine days ago, uh, there was a video on television of a passenger plane in Brazil as it spun out of control and fell to the ground, killing all 62 people on board. And as I watched that video, I kept wondering, what were these people thinking as they were falling from the sky? Uh, what was going through their minds as they knew that their time on earth was about to come to an end? There was one minute between the time when the plane uh, started spinning uncontrollably until the time it hit the ground. What were these people doing during that minute? I wonder if any of them had time to grab their telephones and call a loved one and let them know that they cared about them. I wonder if there was a lot of screaming and crying. I imagine there was a lot of praying that was going on in that last minute. Uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And these people all realized that they were about to die. They all realized that they were facing the judgment. When they got on that plane that morning, they didn't know that. They had no idea that they were never going to reach their intended destination. Uh, maybe some of them were on vacation. I read that there were eight doctors that were going to a, a treatment a clinic on treating cancer so they could be better prepared to be doctors in their research. Uh, some of them may have been on business trips. Let's look at James chapter 4 and start reading in verse 13. It says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. These people knew for the last minute of their life that it was coming to an end. But I wonder, what if they'd known 24 hours earlier? What if they'd known when they got up this morning, that morning, that that was going to be the last day of their life? Now, there wasn't anything they could do to change it. They could have always not got on the plane. But if they woke up that morning knowing this is the last day, what would they have done differently? And that's what I want us to think about this morning. Uh, what would we do if this were our last day? Well, first of all, I can think of some things that I wouldn't do. Go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Jesus is uh, teaching, and we read this when he gives uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 15. There's three parables in Luke 12 or Luke 15. This is one. Anyway, Luke 12, 15. Jesus says, Take heed, for beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If I knew I had one day left to live on earth, I wouldn't spend it building barns. I wouldn't be building any bigger barns. You know, I don't think that that certain rich man would have either if he'd known that was his last day on earth. If he'd realized that this was it, he wouldn't have been thinking about building barns. Verse 20, God called him a fool. And I don't want to spend my last day on earth being a fool. Uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. There's some other things that I wouldn't do. High school volleyball season starts tomorrow. I'm going to Dyersburg. I've got a, a match with Chester County High School and Dyersburg High School, and uh, we're going to start playing volleyball. To get ready for volleyball, we have rules meetings, and we have to go uh, and practice refereeing. And all the high school teams, a lot of them get together, and they play games, and the referees practice. Well, I showed up, and 
well, two weeks ago on Saturday, Freed Hardeman, and there was this referee that I hadn't seen since last season. He came up to me and said, have you lost a lot of weight? I said, well, yeah, yeah, I have. He said, on purpose? And he was worried that I was sick because he hadn't seen me for a year. Uh, to be honest, I'm still mad at Bob Dawson. Bob owns the coffee shop in Rutherford. And when he put in the coffee shop, he bought the building across the street and he was going to put in a pizza place. And I was excited about a pizza place in Rutherford. I could just imagine how often I'd go and how often I'd eat pizza. But once he'd been there for a few months, he realized that he was going to have trouble running one business. And he wasn't going to be able to have two and keep staff. And he didn't have time to, to work at two places all day, every day. So he sold the building. And the people that bought the building didn't want a pizza place. They put in a gym. And I wasn't nearly as excited about that. But since my... Uh, Medicare supplement pays for a free gym membership. I went ahead and joined and I've been going six days a week and I've dropped several pounds and it's good for me and I feel better. My doctor was excited about it. The last time I went to the doctor, even the apostle Paul says exercise is good. Look at 1 Timothy chapter four. 1 Timothy chapter four, beginning in verse seven, Paul says, but refuse profane and old wives fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness for bodily exercise profiteth a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. The English Standard Version says, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. Paul told Timothy, bodily exercise has just a little value. If it's my last day on earth and I know it, I'm going to skip the gym. There's no need of me trying to get any stronger in a body that's not going to last any longer. It's going to go away. Go over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Some of you may not be aware, but we have an election coming up. Uh, I believe the results of this election are going to have a great deal to do with the future of our country. I think that we have a, a choice that we've got to make, and it's going to have lots of impact. And I see all kinds of people posting things online, and some of them I'm terribly... Uh, aggravated by and I oppose those things and sometimes I get drawn in and I post some uh, political stuff online last week I, I posted a cartoon of this wolf up on the podium and the wolf is talking to a bunch of sheep and the wolf says I promise if I'm elected I'll become a vegetarian okay yeah. politicians lie and anyway we won't get into that campaign Featuring social media is, is new in our lifetime. That didn't used to happen. But there have been people fussing and fighting over politics for years and years, in fact, for centuries. Matthew 22, there's a political argument going on. The Pharisees are trying to get Jesus caught up in this political fight. The Jews hated Rome and everything it stood for, but the Roman army was in control and there was a Roman governor that was in charge in Jerusalem. And they wanted to get Jesus in trouble with the Roman governor. Uh, go to Matthew 22 and start reading in verse 15. It says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. They kind of puffed him up a little bit to start with. A little flattery. Verse 17, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? And they thought they had Jesus because if he said, No, it's not lawful to give tribute unto Caesar. We're only supposed to worship God. Uh, we shouldn't give anything to Caesar. Then he'd be in trouble with the Roman government. The Roman soldiers could come and get him and say that he was uh, fighting against the government. If he said, Yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, then the Jews would hate him because they hated Caesar and they didn't want anything to do with him. So they thought they had Jesus. Verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And if I knew I had one day to live left on earth, I wouldn't spend any of it worried about politics. I'm not going to be too worried about who's going to be the next Caesar. Uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference if I'm not here any longer. 
I'm not going to be worried about keeping more of my stuff away from paying tax to Caesar if I only have one day left to live. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. <clears throat> I'm currently starting, I think, about the third year of a one-year online guitar class. Okay. Uh, so far, I've learned about four chords that I can remember, and sometimes I can change from one of them to another and get my fingers on the right string. Okay. And when I practice regularly, if I spend 20 or 30 minutes a night, uh, four or five nights in a row, I get where I can do it a little bit better. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 15. It says, He came forth from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. Ecclesiastes 5.15 says, I'm not taking that guitar with me. If I know this is my last day on earth, I'm going to skip practice tonight. I'm not going to worry about that. There are lots of other things I wouldn't do if I knew it was my last day. I wouldn't try to keep my 213-day wordle streak alive or play any of those other word puzzles that uh, I have on my phone. Uh, I wouldn't check my bank balance. I wouldn't cut the grass. There are a lot of things that I do that I wouldn't do if I knew it was my last day. How many things in your life would go undone if you knew you weren't going to have any more days? Now I want us to think about what we would do. What would you do if you knew that this was your last day? Go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I think if I knew that this was the last day I was going to live, the first thing I would do is take a look at my life and make sure I was ready to leave. I was ready to go. I want to make sure that I'm right with God. 1 John 1, beginning in verse 6. John says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm not going to try to fool myself. I know I've got sin in my life. And if I knew today was going to be my last day, I'm going to be examining my life. I'm going to be saying, is there more sin that I don't think about? Is there something else I need to be confessing? Is there something else I need to be repenting of so that I can be forgiven? In fact, if I knew this was my last day on earth, I'm going to be spending lots of time in prayer. I'll go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is giving his Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew 7, beginning in verse 7, he says this, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, he will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? God is a loving Father in heaven that wants to hear from His children. He wants us to come to Him. He wants us to pray to Him. Uh, and if I knew this was going to be my last day, He would certainly be hearing from me because I want Him to know that I want to be with Him. Now go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. If I knew this was my last day on earth, I think I'd want to spend as much of it as I could with my loved ones and let them know how much I cared about them. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now that passage is usually used to condemn people that, that skip worship service, that don't come together as often as they should. But I think it applies to other times as well. We need to be spending time together so we can encourage each other. We need to be spending time together so we can exhort each other, so we can tell each other how much we love each other. Uh, on August 9th, Sister Paula lost her sister Sylvia. And we went to the funeral home for visitation. We got there 
about 5.30. It opened at 5, and by the time we got there, the people had lined up out the door. It took an hour and 15 minutes from the time we got there to the time we got up to where we could talk to the family. And as we wound through the funeral home, we passed thousands and thousands of dollars worth of flowers and displays and gifts and things that people had brought. It was obvious that people really loved Paula's sister. But you know, she couldn't smell one of those flowers and she couldn't experience one of those hugs. Now the family was comforted, but how much better would it have been if all those people had gone to her while she was still alive, while she was still aware and told her how much they loved her, how much they cared about her, how much they appreciated her. If I have one day left on earth, I'm going to spend it trying to give my flowers to people while they can still appreciate them. I go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. This time Jesus is telling his disciples how to pray. And he's ending the model prayer. Start reading in verse 12. He says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then right after he finishes showing them how to pray, he says this in verse 14. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I don't want to go to the grave holding a grudge because I want to be forgiven. So if I know my time is almost gone, I'm going to go be going to let people know I forgive them. If they've done something to me, I want them to know I'm not holding it against them anymore. I want to be forgiving. But that's not the only thing that Jesus said about making things right. Go back a couple of chapters to Matthew chapter 5. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this beginning in verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Jesus said, if somebody's wronged me, I need to forgive them. But he said, if I've wronged somebody else, I need to go to them and ask them for forgiveness. It doesn't matter who's done the wrong, it's my responsibility to make things right. I'm the one that's supposed to be the peacemaker. It's my job to go to them to make sure that we're where we need to be. So if I've got one day to live, I'm going to be forgiving people. I'm going to be asking them for forgiveness. I'm going to be trying to pay all my debts. I'm going to make sure I don't leave this place owing anybody. Now go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 is talking about the resurrection day. Mark 16, begin reading in verse 9. It says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had seen of her, or been seen of her, believed not. Verse 12, After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. Okay, Mary saw Jesus, and she went out and told the disciples, and they didn't believe it. Jesus appeared to these two men on the road to Emmaus. They went into town and told everybody they'd seen Jesus. And they didn't believe them either. Nobody believed them. Now look at verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now Jesus goes to his disciples and the first thing he did was to chastise them for not believing Mary and those other two men, the other witnesses. He said, they told you I'd been resurrected. Why didn't you believe them? Remember, Jesus had told them he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to die, and he was going to be raised from the dead after three days. He told them that was going to happen. These people came and told the disciples, well, this happened. And they said, oh, we don't believe that. But they didn't believe the good news of Jesus. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's the gospel? Well, we say the gospel is the good news. What's the good news? That Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. Uh, now he's commanding everybody to go into the world and teach the gospel. And then look at verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
I know people that have never believed the good news. They've never obeyed the gospel. And if I had one day left on earth, I'd be going to those people and do everything within my power to get them to understand the gospel, to get them to believe what Jesus said. I get them to try to understand God's plan of salvation. Now, those, there are those that want to parse words and argue. They say, Mark 16, 16 says, if you don't believe, you'll be damned. But it doesn't say if you're not baptized. My first response would be, why take the chance? But if you think about it, that's like saying, he that puts food in his mouth and swallows it shall receive nourishment. But he that doesn't put food in his mouth will starve. We say, well, it doesn't say you have to swallow it. Well, of course, you're not going to get nourishment from food that you don't swallow. Of course, you're not going to be baptized if you don't believe that Jesus is who he said he is, that Jesus said to do what he said to do. Uh, over and over again in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that baptism is for the forgiveness of sin, that we're baptized into Christ, that we're added to the church, that we're added to his body, that we're added to the kingdom of heaven when we're baptized. I knew I had one day to live. I beg people to obey the gospel. Now, how about you? How would you spend the last day of your life if you knew that was the last day? Now, ask yourself this question. How do you know this is not? How do we know? Those people that got on that plane didn't realize that they'd never get off at the other end. We don't know that tomorrow's sun's going to rise. Let's think about one more thing. Jesus knew. Jesus knew when his last day was going to be, when he was going to Jerusalem. He told his apostles that he was going to Jerusalem, that he was going to die, that he was going to be resurrected. He knew that that was his last day. How did Jesus spend his last day on earth? Go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Jesus spent part of his last day on earth uh, spending time with his friends and disciples. They ate together. John 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them until the end. Jesus knew he was about to leave, and the last, one of the last things he did was get the people that he loved and spend time with them. We know that after he left, he went out into the garden and he prayed. We read about Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane, and he Sweat, it was like sweat drops of blood were falling from his face. He was talking to the Father. He wanted to, Father, it be thy will. Take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. So Jesus celebrated with those that he loved. He prayed. But before that, go down to verse 3. John 13, 3 says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he came forth from God and goeth unto God, riseth from supper, layeth aside his garments, and he took a towel and girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. On the last day of his life, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And we usually think about Peter because Jesus started doing that. Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, uh, unless I wash you, you're not going to have any part of me. And then, Jesus, then Peter said, well, wash all of me then. We think about Peter, what we don't think is that Jesus washed Judas' feet too. Jesus, Jesus was a servant. Uh, let's spend today like it's our last day. Jesus loved to the end. Jesus prayed to the end. Jesus served to the end. I won't, don't want to die. I face the judgment and have people come up to me and ask, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? So every time I preach, I end the sermon by saying, you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. If you've never followed the New Testament plan of salvation, you can today. All you've got to do is believe that Jesus is God's Son. Repent of your sins, confess Him as Lord of your life, and have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism. And once you do that, then you need to live every day as if it's our last. Remember the opening passage from James chapter 4? James chapter 4, verse 14, he said, Life was a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanisheth away. A few verses later in verse 17, he said, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You need to be seeking the Lord's will in your life, to be loving as he loved, to be praying like he prayed, to be serving 
as he served. If you need to make a fresh start this morning, I want you to do it right now. As we stand together as we say.